Good morning, and we'll call to order the meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission. Board of Directors, Ms. Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Your first item is to conduct your first citizen's participation in support of the Nevada State Governor's recommendation made on November 10th, 2020 to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in pursuant to the March 22nd, 2020 Declaration of Emergency, Emergency Directive 006, which is excuse me, which suspended the requir requirement to have a physical location for public meetings. And for the health and safety of the community, this meeting is being held virtually. To allow for public participation, the RTC is, has accepted public comments via email at public comments at rtcsnv.com. Comments could be submitted to be read aloud or to be added directly to the written record. Ms. Eileen Pastor will read the public comments received by the RTC. And if I may, uh, MJ, and I apologize, uh, Marin, could we uh, do a roll call for the record? Yes, sir. Marin Dubois, RTC Management Analyst for the record. Um, really quick, in the chambers, we have Commissioner Larry Brown. Present. Mayor Deborah March. Present. Commissioner Jim Gibson. Here. Mayor Kiernan McManus. Here. Then on the line, we have Councilman George Galt. Present. Mayor Carolyn Goodman. Present. And Ms. Christina Swallow. Here. And absent today is uh, Mayor Pro Tem Isaac Barone and Mayor Pro Tem Stavros Anthony. Um, in the chambers, we have Ms. MJ Maynard, CEO, Mr. Francis Julian, Deputy CEO, Mr. David Swallow, Deputy CEO, Mark Trosdahl, Chief Financial Officer, Angela Torres Castro, Chief Strategy Policy and Marketing Officer, Greg Gilbert, Outside Legal Counsel, and then Mr. John Pinuelas, our Senior Director of Engineering, is on the line. And Ms. Eileen Pastor is here to read public comments for us. Thank you. And now we will turn to item number one, citizen participation, our first public comment period. Uh, thank you, Chairman Brown. This is Eileen Pastor for the record. There are no public comments to a posted agenda item. Hearing none, we'll close this portion of public comment. Ms. Maynard. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. The next order of business is to approve the agenda. The agenda is in order and ready for your approval. You've heard the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank aye. You. aye. Any opposed? And that motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next item is to receive the CEO report. And first, we want to recognize an operator from our contractor, MV Transportation. Deputy CEO Francis Julian caught up with Ms. Shirley Durrett to surprise her with the award. We are here to, uh, to honor the uh, most senior paratransit driver in our network, Sherry Darren. Shirley, Shirley has uh, almost perfect on-time performance. In the last six months alone, she safely transported over a thousand passengers and once again, 26 years of service for our community. I can't wait to go and surprise you. Come with me. I wanted to surprise you with a crystal bus for all your years of service. So amazing what you're doing for our community. 26 years. So she just got a crystal bus. Thank you so much for all you do for us. I'm so excited and I'm so thankful for this. And I want to thank everyone that participated. And thank you, thank you, thank you. She's amazing. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, and next, we'd like to recognize a mechanic also from our contractor, MV. Francis also cut up with Mr. Kevin Holshue to present him with this recognition. And now we're at the IBMF garage and we really, really have a team today of high seniority. So we're uh, celebrating Kelvin Holshue. He's been a mechanic for MV for 27 years. Prior to being a mechanic, uh, Kevin proudly served in the U.S. Navy. So thank you for your se uh, service, uh, Kevin. And let's go and surprise him. Kevin is one of the specialists that rebuilds uh, transmission and uh, engines for MV to keep our passenger 
and operator safe and with a reliable ride. So let's go and surprise them. Very talented uh, mechanic. We appreciate all his hard work. And lastly, we have an officer recognition from our security contractor, Marksman. Now we're at the BTC, and we're actually going to surprise Sarah Sutton. Sarah is actually standing right behind me right now. She doesn't know she's going to get surprised. Sarah is an awesome employee. She saw last month a she recognized somebody from a missing person uh, poster and contacted her chain of command and while her chain of command came down she actually calmed and talked to the individual until authorities came to make sure that our, gar our guardians came and, take and took the missing person. Let's go and surprise her. Hi, Francis Julian. I'm the deputy CEO for the RTC. I'm here to actually surprise you with this nice crystal bus for the missing person that you helped last month. Just wanted to thank you so much. So congratulations. You'll be on a oh, you'll be on a video and you'll get the board meeting tomorrow on a video. And but from everybody at the RTC, I just wanted to thank you so much for what you did. That's just awesome. So thank we're really you. proud of you. Thank you, I appreciate it. I would like to say thank you for being recognized for finding a missing person. Um, thank you, RTC. Thank you, Marksman. Um, it's really cool that they show appreciation for the guards when we do do something good. So thank you everybody, I appreciate it. Yeah, they do not have an easy job as security officers, so we thank her very much for her, for her, uh, all of her hard work. So earlier this year, we were awarded uh, by the Federal Transit Authority, or FTA, their Innovations in Transit Public Safety Grant to support three distinct efforts in combating human trafficking. The recent National Human Trafficking Hotline ranks Nevada 13th in the number of trafficking cases reported. Since 2007, the National Hotline has received almost 3,400 calls pertaining to Nevada, leading to more than 1,400 trafficking victims being identified, including children. And why are transit organizations important? Traffickers rely on the transportation industry in every phase of human trafficking, from recruitment to the delivery of victims to buyers. We may be coming in contact with victims on a daily basis. They could be sitting in our buses and transit terminals or waiting at our stops. This grant from the FTA allows public transit agencies to become part of the solution. Since September, we've trained all of our frontline employees, transit operators, and security officers to help identify human trafficking victims and assist them in safely leaving their traffickers. We've partnered with First Med, a local organization to help provide comprehensive wraparound relief services once a victim has been, has been identified on our system. We also partner with UNLV's Criminal Justice Department to evaluate the training program throughout the process. The third portion of the program includes rolling out a community-wide awareness campaign. Over the next couple weeks, you will begin to see this ad displayed throughout the valley to highlight whatever, excuse me, what everyone can do if they believe or see someone who may be trafficked. The campaign will be featured at traffic, at, excuse me, at transit stops, inside transit vehicles, and outside as full vehicle wraps. Posters at our facilities and full building wraps at our downtown transit center, social media advertising, and across digital platforms. We hope this awareness campaign will help bring to light a very serious issue and result in help for human tra trafficking victims. And lastly, for this month's CEO report, we're bidding a fond farewell to our chairman, Commissioner Larry Brown, 
whose leadership is closely intervo interwoven <laughs> with the RTC's history as a public agency. Chairman Brown joined the RTC board in 1997 while serving as a councilman for the city of Las Vegas. He was elected chair of our board in 2008 and joined the Clark County Commission the following year. Over the course of the last 23 years, Chairman Brown has been a strong and steady leader who has always been firm but fair and approached issues with a signature sense of humor. He has helped guide the RTC as we've expanded our range of services and scope, including traffic management and Southern Nevada Strong. He has provided leadership on a range of projects and initiatives like the passage of fuel re revenue indexing and its extension, I-11, Flamingo Corridor improvements, the launch of RTC bike share, as well as countless, countless more FRI projects, MPO planning studies, and transit system improvements. No matter the project or initiative, Chairman Brown's overarching concern has always been the impacts on the community and Southern Nevada's quality of life, whether it's air quality, accessibility, or safety. He has always encouraged us at the RTC to plan for and make a difference in people's lives for the better. Chairman Brown, your quiet but steady leadership will be greatly missed on this board, but we know that you'll continue to be an advocate for our community despite not serving in any official capacity. Thank you for all you've done for Southern Nevada. And, and Chairman Brown, I hope you know, <coughs> excuse me, we have always appreciated how much you support staff, uh, you believe in us, and you're gonna be just greatly missed. Now, we'd like to present you with a little something. Is there any way you could get that middle picture off the screen? <laughs> <laughs> if this is being viewed by millions, I'd really like that one to delete. Yeah, the outside pictures are fine. But we thought that ca that captured you at your finest moment. It, didn't they make a movie of that <laughs> middle picture? Oh, sorry, I'm getting that. Thank you. Chairman Brown, I'd just like to thank you once again for your leadership and vision. You've done amazing things with the RTC, and, and I've really personally enjoyed working with you and, and your leadership and vision. And one of the things that the city of Henderson uh, has done in appreciation for that is we've actually created a street sign called Larry Brown Way. And I want you to know the Raiders went through a lot to get a street named after them. And and we appreciate your leadership, so we've named one after you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the next item is to on the agenda is to receive the NDOT's direct report. Ms. Christina Swallow is on the line to provide this update. Good morning, members of the board. MJ, will your team be sharing my PowerPoint? Y yes. Okay. It's uh, good to be with all of you today, and we'll move straight on to the next slide and start with safety as we always do. Um, so as you can see, fat fatalities continue to be higher than they were last year. At this point, um, comparing year to year, um, as of November 30th, the numbers are up 5% compared to last year, with a total of 278 lives lost on our roadways so far in 2020. Statewide, unrestrained motorist fatalities have gone up a staggering 43% uh, year over year. And in Clark County, they increased 16% from 25 deaths last year to 29 this year. Pedestrian fatalities have also increased significantly in Clark County, while bicyclist fatalities have fallen from six to three. So a little bit of good news. Statewide motorcyclist fatalities have remained steady from this time last year. However, many counties have experienced increasing increases, including Clark with 31 lives lost on motorcycles this year. These numbers are troubling, especially considering our traffic volumes remain down from last year. As I've mentioned, um, these are not just numbers, these are people. 
And I wanted to share a story again to help us understand some of the real lives behind the statistics that we talk about. In the very early hours of Sunday, November 29th, a crash took the life of a motorcycle rider in Las Vegas. The crash occurred on US 95 southbound on the southbound I-15 off-ramp in the Spaghetti Bowl area. A Toyota Camry was speeding down US 95 toward the ramp when it went into a restricted access painted gore, hit an impact attenuator, and was redirected back onto US 95. A black Suzuki motorcyclist hit the car and the rider was ejected. The rider was unfortunately pronounced dead at the scene. The driver of the Toyota was taken to the hospital with minor injuries and then into custody as he was believed to be impaired. Impaired driving continues to be one major cause of motor vehicle crashes, injuries, and fatalities. We are right in the middle of our holiday season. And although we may not be attending as many festive gatherings as in previous years, there are still opportunities where we might find ourselves celebrating. We all need to be mindful about our consumption and getting behind the wheel. And remember to hold your friends and family to account if they're impaired. These are choices that we make, and it is in our hands to keep our holidays merry and bright and safe for each other. Next slide, please. A few months ago, actually throughout this year, we've been talking about the I-15 South interchanges. And a couple of months ago, I said we were completing some analyses and we would come back to the board with the results of that analysis. Uh, we have already met with the city of Henderson and I just wanted to um, go through a few slides with the board to show you what we were looking at and the results of those studies. So um, as I mentioned, we were looking at multiple alternatives. The first alternative you can see here on the slide represented two interchanges, one located at Sloan uh, or Via Inspirata and, if, and a future, I mean, there's an existing interchange there and a future interchange at Via Nobila um, and this reflects what was, what was included and approved in the environmental assessment completed about 12 years ago. There have been some significant changes to the corridor, which was what prompted our relook at the environmental assessment. And those changes are noted on here, including the Speed Vegas site on the east of the I-15 corridor and the future uh, flood control basin on the west of the corridor uh, closer to Via Nobila. The second alternative that we looked at was a single interchange scenario and while the single interchange is reflected here roughly in the middle of the two um, interchanges, um, it could be at any location. This particular location is um, located so that it avoids the Speed Vegas site as well as the Future Basin, but it could be located further north or further south. And then the third alternative that we looked at, next slide. Sorry, I keep forgetting to do that, to say that. Next slide. Uh, the third alternative we looked at was a split interchange. Um, so a north, um, northbound, north-facing interchange at Via, Nobila, uh, Via Inspirata, Via Nobila, and a south and southbound interchange at um, uh, Via Nobila. I may have gotten those wrong, um, but at Sloan. Uh, so this is essentially what a split interchange would look at. There'd be a half in the north, a half in the south, with a connector road in between where all the weaving and merging that occurs between the interchanges would take place in lieu of on I-15. So these are the three options we looked at. Now this next slide, and I recognize, next slide please, I recognize that this is a bit of an eye chart, their numbers are very tiny, so I'm just gonna focus in on a few of them. But th this slide shows the traffic volume projections for the year 2040, which includes the updated Henderson land use plan data. You may recall that when we initially did our studies um, earlier this year and late last year, we didn't have that Henderson data. We did include it in the, the spring and early summer, so these numbers reflect the 2040 volumes, including the Henderson land use data. Um, we looked at both the AM and PCM periods for that time frame. You'll note that the volumes don't add up from uh, across the three. And that's because as we model, uh, drivers make different choices depending on what their access options are. And so they may choose to use a different interchange. They may use to uh, use surface roads. Um, and so the numbers don't exactly line up. Uh, but they are representative of what the models show how people would use and interact with I-15 and the interchanges along them. It's hard to see, uh, but one of the reasons we were looking at a single interchange were the vo low volumes on several of the ramps in, this, in the two interchange version. In that version, the southernmost ramps only have 67 cars in the PM peak hour. 
the other ramp um, and the AM peak hours in those two uh, for those two ramps have even lower volumes than that. And so while a single interchange does address that to some extent, the volumes still remain fairly low on the southern ramps. There were concerns with providing sufficient access to the new development, which prompted the third split interchange alternative. And on the next slide, we'll look at the results of the analysis. Next slide, please. Again, another, a little bit of an eye chart here, um, but I did wanna show you and talk through a little bit of um, the outcomes. So you can see here what each scenario would mean if it included braiding or no braiding. I, I should mention that we did look at braiding or no braiding including the costs, the impacts to speed, and traffic operations involved. So um, I'm going to focus on the no braiding options briefly um, because uh, the braiding, it didn't really show to have any real impact or positive impact. It did have some, but not as significant. I should note that braiding may be required by the time we get to a 2040 timeframe in actuality, depending on how volumes change and how development happen, or it could be required at a later date at which point um, those, uh, those benefits would be realized. So just looking at the no braiding option, you can see the single interchange, all three of the interchange options had similar predicted crash rates, which is, which is good that there's not a significant difference in crashes. However, there was a fairly significant uh, difference in mainline speed impacts between the single and the dual option. As you can imagine, if you have dual interchanges, you'll have more weaving in between those two interchanges and so there was a significant degradation to uh, the main line speeds on I-15 with the dual option. There is, a, there is also a significant increase in cost. Of course, if you're building one interchange versus two, there's, it, there's more um, expense to build the two interchanges. So I wanted to show this to you so you would all be aware of some of the things that were considered as we were going into this process and why we were opening the dialogue and having the conversation or trying to have the conversation. We greatly appreciate the City of Henderson and RTC for uh, their time and efforts in helping us plan for the growth of this area and better serve our valley commuters. Um, both interchanges are currently included in the RTP. Uh, the first interchange, uh, the Northern interchange is included in 2026 to 2030 year frame, time frame. And the second interchange is uh, between 2041 and 2045. So more than 20 years from today. Both are currently federally funded. And while our projections show that a single interchange will be the area for the decades of projected growth, I, I should note that it has less access options and we would have to look at how to provide those access via surface roads or something else. Um, and it will have the least impact on the main line to the valley. The time between now and construction of the second interchange is significant and it may allow for further changes in growth of the area growth in travel volumes or other changes that we, we yet don't know. So again, reiterating, they're both currently included in the plans and both are currently federally funded. As you know, the RTP is updated every four years and priorities and realities may shift during that time. This four years, next four years, or four years after that, which may allow and encourage future conversations about funding sources for the second interchange given the funding constraints we all face and the need to meet the ever-growing needs of the Valley overall. Like I said, both interchanges are currently included in the RTP and are both are currently planned for federal funding. Our next steps are uh, to continue to coordinate with the city of Henderson to finalize the interchange configurations of the first interchange as that one is coming up uh, fairly quickly. It's still six years out at a minimum, but um, we do need to start working on figuring that out and to finalize the reevaluation of the environmental document and update the appropriate uh, planning documents. Next slide, please. All right, I wanted to move on and provide the board with an update on the I-15 to 15 interchange construction in the Northeastern quadrant of the Valley. As we are, we are nearly a quarter of the way complete on this project. The $99 million project launched earlier this year with Fisher Sand and Gravel as our general contractor. Work is progressing on the new flyovers, a new off-ramp and structures, along with utility and lighting work. Project improvements include extending Tropical Parkway to Centennial Parkway, replacing Range Road as an east-west surface connection, a new eastbound 215 Beltway off-ramp to the new Centennial Parkway and Range Road intersections, and other improvements. As I mentioned, we're about a quarter of the way through. You've probably seen some closures related to the construction. 
work is expected to last into 2022. Next slide, please. And now an update on the I-15 Tropicana design build. Uh, the department issued our request for qualifications for design build teams in September, and we just finalized the review of the SOQs and shortlisted three design build teams. We received three SOQs and all three teams made the shortlist. The teams are, include Ames Construction, Horrocks Engineers, Las Vegas Paving, Jacobs, Hewitt and Atkins. The next steps on this project include issuing the draft request for proposals this month and the final RFP in early 2021. We anticipate receiving proposals in the spring of 2021 and award of the contract in summer of 2021. And then I wanted, next slide, thank you, uh, to update you on the final phase of uh, the Centennial Bowl. Uh, this project has been going on for a really long time and it is so very needed in the Northwest quadrant of our Valley. So it's exciting to get this final phase underway. In phase 3D, the crews will finish up the three remaining system to system ramp. They'll construct a local interchange within the system interchange construct a multi-use path within the system in partnership with the city of Las Vegas. That's a great partnership and, and a testament to how working together can really um, leverage benefits for all uh, stakeholders. And widen Low Mountain over US 95. Construction will begin on January 4th, 2021, just a few weeks from now, and will be complete in early 2024. Las Vegas Paving is the contractor and the total construction estimate, which includes NDOT's cost to administer the contract, approximately 155 million, uh, which includes 113 mil million federal, approximately 40 million state, and approximately 2 million local. And, and we did a uh, bond to help cover, uh, bond against our FRI funding to help cover the cost of this particular uh, project. The team is planning a virtual groundbreaking event in the week of 20, January 11th, which will include stakeholder interviews. So many of you may be, uh, some of you may be contacted to help participate in that. And then I wanted, I have a long report today for you. Sorry, folks. Um, I wanted to give an update. I should have done this back in August or September after our board approved our annual work program. And I apologize, I didn't do it sooner, but we're doing it now. But I did wanna give you an update on the 2021 to 2024 work program and how the funding is distributed across the state. As you can see here on the slide, um, approximately 63% of the NDOT-led prioritized projects. Oh, please go back to the previous slide. Approximately 63% of the NDOT-led projects are um, planned to be within uh, Clark County. Washoe has approximately 17% and the rest of the state is 20%. Now I'll tell you that this work program does not include NDOT-led transit, which is our rural transit program. Um, anything that's NEPA only, bond repayments. Um, if all of those were included in the investment distribution, the distribution would be 60% Clark, 13% Washoe. Um, and so uh, we can move on to the next slide now. I did want to look at the, and provide you the information of what the look back looks like. So the past 10 years, how have we actually spent the money? And you can see that historically, if you look back 10 years, um, it was 56% or 54% uh, if you pull out those statewide funds. And the reason why it differentiates is we can allocate those statewide funds or divide them separately because they are spent in Clark County as well as all the other counties. So between uh, 54 and 56% is how we have invested in Clark over the last 10 years. So our annual work, work program looking forward is an improvement and we are continuing to strive to um, increase the investment in Clark to the extent that our uh, resources and our, our, our uh, preservation goals allow us to. The next slide, please. It's a STIP program, which does not include like some of our betterment projects, which are some of our paving projects. The numbers um, for Clark in the next four years are actually 60% uh, if you exclude the statewide, but if you allocate that across the, the state, um, it's actually 67% of the, of the funds will be invested in Clark County. Um, I, some of the things to note on this is it does, uh, our betterment, some of our betterment projects are only in years one and two. We're um, still working on developing those for the out years. And generally the out years, so years three and four, have room to um, add projects or adjust the projects because they're still a little further out. 
Um, so what's not included in here are um, any of the MPO sub allocated funds, um, planning and non, um, non project spending. So our operations, our vehicles, et cetera. Um, I did wanna share this with you so that um, we can continue to have a very transparent conversation about how we're spending our revenue across the state. And then lastly, I did want to welcome a new team member. Uh, you may be aware that for about a year and a half, we were shy, uh, one of our executive leadership team members, our, our assistant director of engineering. And so I am very excited to welcome Jeff LaRude to our leadership team. Jeff graduated from UNR with a bachelor's of science in civil engineering. He's a registered PE and a certified public manager. He started his career in, in, with the department in 1995, where he initially worked in roadway design but he also worked in traffic operations divisions and then project management where he's managed projects in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the North and South for the last 10 years. And most recently was on the Tropicana design build project, which he's had to transition now in his new role. And we saw him most recently in our, um, at the RTC board when he was uh, talking to us about the HOV lanes. And just tenure with the department spans 25 years with 20 years in Northern Nevada and the last five in Southern Nevada. He has a unique perspective and clear understanding of the opportunities and the challenges we face as a department and we face um, in Clark County as well. We're happy and very excited to have Jeff in his new role. Uh, welcome, Jeff. And then I did, right before I conclude, next slide, please. I did just want to say, which is not actually this at all, um, thank you, uh, Chairman Brown, for your, for your leadership, for your service, and for your commitment to transportation. You and your voice will be greatly missed. So, thank you. Comments or questions? Mayor? Thank you, Director Swallow. I want to thank you for your report. It was a very solid update on what is being done at the I-15 uh, in the Henderson area, and we continue, we look forward to continuing our discussions with NDOT to find the right solution for that, that area of our city. So thank you very much. Happy holidays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next on the agenda is to approve the consent agenda, which consists of items 5 through 48 and may be taken in one motion. Motion on the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Great. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. The next item is our legal item, and there are no matters to bring before the board at this time. So we'll move on to the, your final item, which is your to conduct your last citizen's participation period. Emphasize on the last public <laughs> comment period. Do we have any comments? Uh, thank you, Chairman Brown. Again, this is Eileen Pastor. We have four public comments that were submitted. Your first comment is from Dorothy Barnes. I've asked that my name be removed from drug trafficking programs. I'm tired of being lied on and stolen from through this bus system. Your second public comment is from Stephanie Versnick. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Stephanie Versnick, and once again, I am testifying before you for the 34th time. I know everyone has heard my story. My story has not changed. I am a mom speaking on behalf of my son, Christian, who does not drive due to his autism. I still live a half mile outside of the service area. I have not moved, nothing has changed, including not expanding the service area. I continue to testify each month for the last 34 months. I've been asking this, this RTC commissioners to expand the service area in this community. I understand we are in a pandemic and 2020 has been a rough year for everyone. Things are different now and I get that. However, disabilities do not stop because of a pandemic. Transportation does not need does not need suffering, I apologize, transportation needs do not stop because of a pandemic. People continue to live their lives the best we, way we can. Many people are suffering and not having transportation should not be one of the things that they worry about. Why can't public transportation for people with disabilities be one of things they don't have to worry about? Why can't paratransit be a service that is here for the most vulnerable members of our community? Until this commission expands the service area, which in my opinion is long overdue, I have asked this commission to develop an affordable premium service plan option for people who live outside of the service area. For the last 10 months, I've asked this commission to develop a plan and add it to the agenda as an item to vote on. 
Commissioner Brown, commissioners, and Ms. Maynard, why is my request being ignored? I feel I have been respectful to this commission. In my opinion, my request is not unreasonable. Does this commission not have the respect to acknowledge a request from a member of the community? I am very disappointed with the lack of communication of this commission. In my opinion, it is very rude and unprofessional to continue to ignore a request being made in public comment. This is my community. My son and I are taxpayers in this community. Public comment is designed for the public to share their requests and concerns. We are given three minutes to talk, and in the virtual world, 500 words or less will be read as part of the record. What is the purpose of public comment if requests, concerns, or suggestions do not even get acknowledged? People take time out of their day to testify because they care about this community. This commission does not have the common courtesy to respond. Once again, I am requesting to have a proposed affordable premium service plan added to January's agenda and ask this commission to be prepared to discuss and vote. I am once again hoping that my request is recognized and not ignored for the 10th time. Your third public comment is from Robin Kincaid. Good morning. My name is Robin Kincaid, and this is the 27th time I have come before this commission regarding the need to change paratransit service area back to the 2011 configuration. If we are going to support growth in this community, we must find a way to meet the needs of persons with disabilities. It's critical that we visit the configuration of the service area and determine how we can reconfigure the shape of the map to eliminate inlets that contain essential services. As the Vegas Valley expands, the access for persons with disabilities continues to shrink and results in fewer choices and opportunities for persons with disabilities. In the January 2020 meeting, Mayor Goodman brought up the concept of a premium rate to be able to address the needs of individuals that cannot get service. This might apply to either a person with disability who does not living in the service area or might to access a business, new friend or relative that moved out of the service area. Please place this proposal on the t January 2021 agenda for consideration. I have mentioned these concerns in the past two meetings, October and November 2020, with no follow-up from RTC. Please respond to these concerns. Using the website to book rides and either seeing no solution found or being told to call back, it should not require multiple phone calls to obtain a ride. The April 2018 Federal Transit Authority report found deficiencies in this area and corrective action was ordered. I do not believe that corrective action occurred and I'm asking for an investigation into these practices. The current practice constitutes a waiting list and is in violation of section 37.131 F2. Ride RTC, RTC ride check system has significantly provided less information such as a prediction of when the bus will arrive. I understand that since the change to MV, bus riders will have to wait six to nine months to start receiving information online that they were receiving with a previous contractor. One of the recent challenges is that ride check text users are only given information in military time. Current schedules for non-paratransit bus service are not published in military time. Persons with disabilities have not been provided any training to be able to understand how to convert the time to standard time. Please review this practice and consider communicating only in standard AM PM time to all bus riders. On Tuesday, October the 6th, my daughter Kayla was on the bus and the bus was involved in a traffic accident. Kayla was not hurt, but did end up missing her college class. There was not any notification to family and there was some concern that since she was missing and on a bus for over two and a half hours. Please review this practice when a paratransit rider is involved in a vehicle accident. There has not been any follow-up by RTC staff regarding this concern. In the spirit of transparency, please revisit the public comment process. These artificial deadlines of 5 p.m. the night before the meeting are unreasonable. When can the public call in or participate using a virtual platform? Ms. Maynard, I am asking you to address these issues and provide a response prior to the next RTC meeting. And your fourth and final public comment is from Raymond Fletcher. Good morning, Chairman Brown and members of the RTC Commission of Southern Nevada Board of Commissioners. For the record, my name is Raymond Fletcher. I make these comments as a private citizen and my words should not reflect any organization. Commissioner Brown, over the years I've gotten to know you and you are an extremely humble man. While you may not do kudos or accolades, I cannot allow this moment to go by without acknowledging all the wonderful things you've done over the past few years I've been attending these meetings. I've had the privilege of interacting with numerous transit boards and organizations in my over quarter century advocacy for people with disabilities. 
What I can honestly say is that your leadership to this board of this agency is second to none. You are a fair man who not only listens, but hears the concerns people present to you. It is with a heavy heart that we as a community say goodbye to your tenure as chairman of this body. But it is also a joy that I know that this board, that this organization is in a better place because of your stewardship, because of your leadership. For many years, I've had to fight tooth and nail and claw my way to get an equal opportunity that my non-disabled peers experience on a daily basis. That is not the case with you. You were always willing to hear discrepancies, listen to ideas, and look at things in a different manner matter that you may not had considered previously. If ever at all you begin to embark on your future endeavors, the opportunity presents itself to collaborate and work together with you on any project, I surely welcome that opportunity. Regrets and a lifetime we often have many, but since meeting you and working with you over the past six or seven years, I only have a couple actually. The first one is those in the public who claim that you don't care. I can say nothing is further from the truth. Having sat down with you, haven't spoken with you, and having gotten to, to know you over the years, I know you to be an extremely compassionate man who cares about equality and equal access for all individuals. Hopefully the incoming chair will not have to be berated or deal with 27 months of complaints because of actions others willingly chose to make on their own. Having moved across the nation, as you well know at this point, and being an individual with a disability who uses a wheelchair, I know what not only my responsibilities are, but what I should do should I need to be able to access public transportation. If I had one wish, it would be that you would not have had to endure 27 months of assaults on your character and your genuine care about our community. Thank you for your leadership, thank you for your guidance, and most importantly, thank you for your friendship. Uh, Chairman Brown, that concludes your public comment. Thank you, and before we close public comment, and with the indulgence of the board, uh, being my last meeting, uh, council, I'm, I think I'm okay with this. I'd like to put some comments on the record, um, especially um, just take a moment to address Stephanie and Robin's public comments. Um, we certainly acknowledge that they've made comments 34 times now and 26 times. Uh, and they've made several requests of the RTC uh, as far as restoring paratransit to the 2011 levels to have a board discussion regarding the service area, uh, report to the FTA on the compliance review audit, provide premium service option for customers outside the service area, uh, among others. And I can attest to this board and the RTC Staff have responded to all of these requests and concerns in different ways. Uh, we've had uh, presentations here at the board. We've had studies uh, paid for and done. Uh, documentation and, and certainly one-on-one -on -one conversations with both Stephanie and Robin. Um, in response to requests to expand the service area and to understand how other agencies provide paratransit services, we engaged a third-party contractor to perform a paratransit service peer study re using the National Transit Database. Uh, the RTC was also asked about its corrective action plan in response to the FTA's ADA paratransit compliance review audit. And as was mentioned in prior meetings, um, the audit directed the RTC to make enhancements in nine of 30 uh, categories Staff updated the board with details on how staff addressed eight of these areas and continually is working to resolve the last issues in the remaining category. Uh, RTC staff has received and fulfilled a dozen or so public record requests and other inquiries from Stephanie and Robin with information on spending as far as the proposed bus wash, the overhaul of the RTC website, trip to strip, camera upgrades, how routes are determined and other such requests. Stephanie has frequently asked what the purpose of testifying if the board isn't listening. And certainly the board is listening. I have spoken with and directed staff to research these concerns and provide details for all of these requests, as have many of uh, my colleagues over the uh, many months that you've appeared here. Uh, despite all the requests being fulfilled and questions answered, I expect we will not be able to resolve 
your uh, concerns until we provide additional paratransit service to areas outside the service area. The RTC appreciates the important role it plays in providing transit service and mobility options to our most vulnerable residents. When the RTC is cutting millions in transit service and has experienced funding short shortfalls in the tens of millions of dollars, RTC is simply not in a financial position to expand any transit services and will not be in the foreseeable future. Even a request for a premium service option outside of the service area is not possible. Any scenario is going to entail a significant subsidy, uh, which unfortunately is not a viable option today. It could be in the future, and at the appropriate time when we're in a better financial situation, we can certainly look at some of those options. And in closing, as this is my final meeting, the concern and care that you have for your children, as well as for the disabled community, should be acknowledged and commended. This board, and I can speak on behalf of the entire board, has tremendous empathy for the both of you, your children, and the disabled community. Many of us have personal experiences with the community, and you should never take the position that we're not listening and we don't care. Please know we would like to provide paratransit services to everyone who needs it, but just like our fixed route, we can't. Uh, the demand for our fixed route expansion is as great or greater than the need to expand the paratransit, and currently we just don't have the financial ability to do so. Um, in closing, and, and Robin, you know that I've known Kayla uh, since our Little League days, and, and, and it hurts sometimes to hear um, the both of you talk about how this board is not listening and how staff is not responding, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. I would encourage and expect both of you to continue to come up and, and speak uh, at our board meetings, and rightfully so. You can't let this issue go away. Uh, you have been very respectful in almost all cases, to staff and to the board, and, and I thank you for that, because some of our public comments do not uh, approach us the same way. So continue your advocacy, but please, uh, especially during this pandemic and during the holiday season, please understand that this RTC board does care, does have empathy, and does want to be part of a solution to uh, meet, if not all of your expectations, certainly uh, the ability to expand someday the transit system. So I thank you for your participation over the past couple years. I anticipate you'll continue that contribution. So with that, I will close public comment. Thank you all. As I mentioned earlier at, RT, uh, at flood control, uh, public infrastructure is so great. And this regional board, thanks to the member agencies, uh, it's one of the few regional boards that truly get along and due to the collaboration and cooperation of all our cities and county, it, it makes us a, a premier agency throughout the country. There's no question that people all over this nation look to the RTC as, as the five-star agency. And that's because of you people sitting here today and, and past leadership and uh, keep up the great work. And I'm sure we'll see you. I will be in the back row on a quarterly basis, ready to make my three-minute comment uh, on a quarterly basis, not too often, though. Thank you all. Enjoy the holidays. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Happy holidays.